Thank you, Brady. If you would, take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 2 this morning. Matthew chapter 2. And we'll, uh, in a few moments, read the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 2. On December the 17th of 2010, Mohammed Bazuzi, 26 years old, went to set up his vegetable stand in the city in which he lives. The city is Sidi Bouzadid, 190 miles south of Tunis in the nation of Tunisia. He set up his vegetable stand of which he is the sole provider of all the income for their family. That morning, a police officer came by, confiscated his cart, and patted and pounded, and took away all the opportunity he had for making a living that day. He told the policeman, what's the fine? She said, seven dollars U.S. That's about what he made a day feeding his family from that vegetable stand. She refused to take the fine, kept the cart. He went down to the city hall the next morning to demanding that he pay the fine and be given his cart back and they would not let him in the door. This is the fourth time that's happened. In an absolute act of desperation, Mohammed came back later in the day with a little bit of gasoline and a match. And on the steps of that city hall, poured the gasoline on his head and struck the match and lit himself on fire. It was the first act of what has become known as the Arab Spring. People with cell phone cameras captured that moment in time. It went on YouTube and then Facebook and then around the world. And Arab people all over Northern Africa and the Middle East rose up and said, if this man's willing to do this, we can stand up to our dictators. And for the last year, we've watched an extended display, if you will, of people who want to hold on to power and people who want to gain power. And we have witnessed how difficult it is to give power up. Right now in the nation of Syria, it's been going on for nine months. It is to the point that the protests are ritualized. The Muslims go to Friday prayers and at midday when the prayer services are over, they turn out into the street and they protest the government. And every Friday, whenever they begin to protest, the nation, the president releases his security forces upon the crowds marching through the street. And at this day, 5,000 have been killed. And so far, the people have been peaceful until a week ago Friday when two men drove car bombs into the middle of the soldiers and detonated them. And last Friday, as the security forces were rolling into Damascus, a gentleman ran up beside the bus carrying bombs wrapped around his chest and detonated them on the side of the bus carrying the soldiers and 25 died and 46 were injured. Holding on to power. You and I do not realize the blessing and the power of democracy until we see dictators and despots around the world trying to hold on to power. What we know is that every four or eight years, the President of the United States walks out of the White House, gets in a limousine, that limousine takes him to Andrews Air Force Base where he gets on a helicopter, and that helicopter takes him to Air Force One, and Air Force One carries him home wherever he lives in the United States. Four years ago, George Bush was carried from Washington, D.C., to Midland, Texas. And Barack Obama was inaugurated into office and power was transferred. That's the way you and I think about power being transferred. And it'll happen again, and it'll happen again, and it'll happen again, we hope. But that's not the way power's been transferred throughout history. We live in a time of anomaly. Matthew chapter 2, the transfer of power is behind the text. In this time of King Herod 
after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who's been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. And when King Herod heard this, he was frightened in all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time the star appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child and when you have found him, bring me word so that I also may go and pay him homage. And when they had heard the king, they set out and there ahead of them went the star and they had seen it, it's rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. And on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they knelt down and paid him homage. And then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Most of the time when you and I see someone hanging on to power, it's in a, well, it's in a petty way. You've seen the movie The Help. The president of the Junior League in Jackson, Mississippi ruled the Junior League by intimidation and isolation. She didn't care if she destroyed the whole club as long as she was in control. You've seen it with pastors who've held on to churches and vowed to tear things down lest they surrender. You've seen it with CEOs of business. But you probably haven't seen anyone like Herod. Herod was constantly looking over his shoulder. One day he asked his nephew if he wanted to go out to the Mediterranean, go to the beach with us. His nephew was tall, which is always nice if you're going to be a leader. He was good looking, which helps all the more. And people liked him. The nephew took up the offer to go to the beach and they were at the beach and Herod sitting on the beach and the boy, teenager out playing in the surf and body surfing with the guards of Herod and pretty soon one thing led to another and you know how horseplay begins and they begin dunking each other and before long he was dead. Drowned by Herod's bodyguards. When Herod took power he executed every member of the Jewish Sanhedrin and installed his own panel. People loyal to him. Herod is looking over his shoulder constantly and now these wise men have shown up from the east saying there is a new king of the Jew and to make it worse, it's, he comes with a star. And you do not blow off signs in the heavens. In the ancient world, one time a comet appeared over Rome and it was always thought when a comet appeared, someone of significance was going to die. And so Nero had several noblemen executed, hoping the comet would say, well, enough notable people have died. We don't need to take the emperor. Now they've come with a star, this one a positive star, this one announcing the birth of a king. And Herod says to them, you go... You go find him, and I'll come worship him too. Then he calls together his hand-picked Sanhedrin. And he says to them, these wise men are looking for the new Jewish king. Where would they find him? And the chief priest and the scribes, don't miss this. The chief priest and the scribes quote scripture to these astrologers, these practicers of the dark arts, these concoctors of witchcraft. They quote scripture to these wise men. 
And the wise men leave and go off to find this new king. And the men who knew the scriptures did not. You know, I grew up hearing a phrase. And I bet you did too. I don't hear it as much as I used to, but every now and then I still hear it. Somebody will say, oh, so-and-so. He really knows his Bible. Or I like her Sunday school class. She really knows her Bible. What does that mean? Somebody says, oh, they really know their Bible. What does that mean? Does that mean they've memorized large portions of Scripture? Does that mean they can quote chapter and verse? Or does that mean they have some theory figured out, you know, like when Jesus is going to return and they take this verse and this means this and this verse means this and this verse means this and pretty soon they can say he's going to return next Tuesday. Does that mean they know the Bible? What does it mean to know the Bible? Because these men, these, the chief priest and the scribes, they know the Bible. They quote the scripture from Micah 5 and 2 Samuel. They quote the scriptures. But they don't go look for him themselves. They send the Iranians off to go look for them. They send the astrologers, the stargazers, the potion makers. They stay home. You know, we Baptists have one of the most notable people who knew the Bible in all of American history in our ranks. John D. Rockefeller, the richest person in the history of the world, was a Baptist. Did you know that? John D. Rockefeller started with an oil refinery in Ohio. And he and his brother began expanding and expanding and pretty soon they cut a deal with the railroads that they could haul their kerosene at 50% of what every other company would haul on the railroads. And that put the competitors in a real bind. And then they began to buy up this refinery and this refinery and that refinery and pretty soon he owned 90% of the refining capacity in the United States. And if you wanted your oil refined, you had to do it through him. He's the first man in the history of the United States to make a billion dollars. When he died, 1937, he's worth $373 billion during the Depression. You roll that up in the inflation, that's $663 billion of personal wealth. That's 10 times more than anybody else of wealth in our world today. And he did it by ruthlessness, by manipulation, by backroom deals, and just plain meanness. But do you know what? The whole time he's building that company, he's teaching Sunday school at the Erie Street Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio. He knew his Bible. Or did he? He retired in 1897 and went on to live 40 years. He spent the rest of his life trying to give away those billions. And he did some good things. Took a little Baptist college in Chicago and gave him $80 million and made the University of Chicago what it is today. He was appalled that black students in the south were not allowed to go to college in state supported schools and even in private institutions and he started black colleges all across the south so that black children could have a chance to become educated he gave the first grant in New York City to build a medical research institute without John D. Rockefeller we would not enjoy the national park system as we have it today in this country his biographer, Ron Chertoff, said about him, the trouble with Rockefeller is he was as good as he was good at being bad as he was bad. And the whole trouble was he knew the Bible the whole time. What is it when someone says to you, oh, he really knows his Bible. What are they saying to you? Because you see, these chief priests, these scribes, 
They knew where the Messiah was. They knew their Bible, but they didn't go bother to look for him. So they send the wise men. And Herod says to them, if you find him, come back and tell me and I'll go worship him. Well, they found him. They found him in a house with his mother and they came in with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, there are a lot of assumptions about the Christmas story that we make. You know, and we make the assumption that Mary rode a donkey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Can't find that anywhere in the scripture, but you make that assumption because you think if a husband's gonna take his wife on a trip that far, being that pregnant, he's gonna do something for her. And we make the assumption that there are three wise men. You know, after all, they came with three gifts and who, they're all gonna show up with a gift. That's a polite thing to do. So there must be three of them. People tell us that there had to be a whole caravan of them because wise men would never have traveled across Arabia with just the three of them. They would have come in a large group, a caravan, protection from renegades, but also protection from the elements. And they come with these gifts and they find Mary and Joseph and this baby and they worship him. Now they don't know much Bible. But they have met the Savior. And in meeting the Savior, the Holy Spirit speaks to them and says, you don't need to go back and tell Herod about this. So they go another way. It doesn't take much Bible to meet Jesus. And it doesn't take much Bible for Jesus to change your life. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we think Christianity is all about knowledge. It's not about knowledge. It's about living a spirit-filled life in worship of Jesus Christ our Lord. And the scripture is our guide in serving him. Can I tell you about my friend Lonnie's Christmas Eve service? Lonnie has a way of stumbling into trouble without meaning to. He's Christmas Eve, they spoke about the peace flame at the Church of the Nativity. There is in the floor of the Church of the Nativity a flame that has been burning for over a thousand years without interruption. It has never gone out. They have a way to fill the reservoir with oil and it keeps that flame going and it never goes out. Well, in the mid 80s, a radio station in Austria concocted a plan that they would somehow light a torch from that peace flame and they would carry that thing back to Austria. And they've invented a box that they lit this flame in Bethlehem at the Church of Nativity and they place that flame inside that box and they will let them get on an airplane with a burning flame. It's an amazing piece of technology. Now what you need to know about the church and nativity is, is it's divided into geographical regions inside the church. The Roman Catholics have an area, the Greek Orthodox have an area, and the Armenian apostles have an area. And it's kind of like your brother or sister's bedroom when you were fighting, you know, you made a line in the floor and you said, you cannot come onto my side of the room and if you do, I'll beat you up. You know, those kind of, they have lines in the floor. There's a Catholic area, a Greek Orthodox area, an Armenian area, and they do not get on each other's lines. And every year after Christmas, when that church has had about half a million visitors come through there in a month, they close it down and they have Christmas cleaning. And it starts on December the 26th. And the Catholics clean their area and the Greeks clean their area and the Armenians clean their area. Now back to the peace flame. They've lit this flame in 1987 and they carried it back to Austria and Boy Scouts took this flame around to different places, different churches, different schools, different community and said, this is the flame of peace. And they lit other torches and they lit them around Austria and they did it the next year and pretty soon it got bigger and bigger and they started carrying that flame around the world and other countries in Europe and they wanted that and Boy Scouts got involved and in 2008 they brought it to the United States for the first time and the Boy Scouts lit a flame at Kennedy Airport in New York City and by the time they stopped just before Christmas that flame was in Seattle. 
carried it all the way across the country, a flame intended to remind us of peace. Now, you can see how this could go well in a Christmas Eve service. Lonnie is talking about lighting these flames of peace in the name of Christ and going out into the world. You are the light of the world. You, you, you can see how that would work at Christmas Eve. And he sent them out. The next day at the church of nativity, hundreds of priests cleaning from the chandeliers to the floor to the pews. And one of the Armenian priests moved his broom across the line. And a Greek Orthodox priest saw him come across the line. And I think probably a little bit of dirt from the Armenian side came onto the Greek side. And one thing was said, and this thing was said, and that thing was said. And before you knew it, the priest had spun their push brooms off the handle and they were fighting. A hundred priests with broomsticks in the church nativity racking each other over the head. It became so bad that the riot, Palestinian riot police came in in full riot gear and batons to beat up priests to get them to quit fighting. Lonnie's church members saw this on the internet and they began passing it around. He got a phone call the night of the 26th. Hey, preacher, so much for your peace flame idea. <laughs> Hundreds of priests who know the Bible but don't know how to behave in Christ. This story today starts with a dictator looking over his shoulder for a new king and it ends with a group of biblically illiterate wise men finding Jesus being nudged by the Holy Spirit and going home another way it's not it is not always what you know the question is, has what you know about Jesus changed your heart? Has it changed the way you reflect and interact with your family? Does what you know about Jesus change the way you do business? Does what you know about Jesus change the way you speak to your friends, to strangers? To migrants does what you know about Jesus changed you we're going to sing just as I am this morning for our hymn of invitation and I ask you to earnestly ask that question is my faith just about what I know or is my faith about the God I worship in Christ is my faith about having memorized something from God's word that I believe to be holy or is my faith about living out the example of Jesus Christ? It's wonderful to know. But the gospel's called us to go and live and serve in the name of Christ. I ask you to stand this morning as we sing together just as I am and you ask yourself that question. Am I living what I know in Christ?